Hello, everyone. Welcome to the President's Live Briefing. Um, we have about 194 people who have registered for today's meeting. Um, so I will um, hand it over shortly to the President, but before that, just want to remind you that if you have questions um, that you want to add, you are able to add them to the Q&A below. Um, and um, we will answer those questions after the presentations that will follow. Over to you, Dr. Lemons. Thank you, Yoshanda. Good afternoon. It's great to have everyone here this afternoon. I'm happy to have back with me Provost Nosu and Vice President Rotolo. Thank you both for joining us in this President's Briefing. The past 10 days, uh, we've been dealing with a lot. Uh, it's been added on to three months of already a lot to deal with on our campus and in the world around us. So before we turn to questions that come in and, and move on with the topics that we're going to plan to cover, I wanted to say a few things about what we've been experiencing uh, in the past 10 days. On top of three months of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, with the Bronx being the epicenter of infection and fatality, we're now confronted with this horrific killing of George Floyd so soon after the killings of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery. These have been days of pain and outrage, and that continues. Areas of the Bronx have experienced looting of small businesses, and some of them have been totally destroyed. You may have seen Borough President Ruben Diaz Jr. Uh, with a number of elected officials two days ago holding a public meeting. During part of that meeting, he introduced a store owner whose store is on Burnside. She spoke through tears telling how her shop was destroyed, how she had worked so hard to build that up and how everyone had worked to, to build that neighborhood. And the destruction is really a terrible consequence of, of what's happened in Minneapolis. But the sustained protests in over 100 U.S. cities and around the world, including people from many ethnicities, are showing that there is a broad coalition of people who are fed up with police violence directed at the black and brown community. And they're also fed up with the longstanding marginalization of black and brown communities, the failure to allocate resources equitably, the lopsided way that COVID-19 has impacted those communities and the one right around us. Along with all of them, we affirm loudly and clearly again that Black Lives Matter. Although that shouldn't be necessary, it should be obvious. I hope you read the email I sent out to the campus on Sunday afternoon. I think it's important to state clearly where we all stand. Lehman College through its legacy and, and through its students and its faculty remains one of the beacons of hope in the Bronx. The legacy of its namesake, sake, Herbert Lehman, demands that the college play a part in the struggle for equity and a just society. But we can't just stand on that legacy as if that is enough because it isn't. When something big so like this happens, change has to happen, it has to follow. And we have to take action and Lehman College must also do that. In the words of Professor Glaude, who I quoted in my email to the campus, you and I, and those of us who are committed to a more just America, a new America, if we have to get about the business of building it now. COVID has changed everything. We can't go back to what was. We can't allow people to double down on their ugly commitments. We have to finally muster the courage to build a new America. This morning, the cabinet discussed what our next steps should be in response to what's happened in the past 10 days. I'll establish a small representative group that will begin immediately to identify the steps that we will take. We don't yet know what those steps will be, and we will consider carefully and thoughtfully as we move ahead. But we will take those steps, addressing the issues of inequality and racism in our world and on our campus, having discussions where all voices are heard, educating ourselves and increasing our liter literacy around the issues of race 
and speaking out when it's called for. And I hope that all of you here today will be an integral part of that process as it unfolds. Now I'd like to ask Provost Mosu uh, if you also have comments that you would like to add at this point. Thank you so much, uh, President Lemons. Your uh, message last uh, Sunday and certainly this afternoon uh, speak volumes and speak much about the feelings across our campus and across our community. Our nation was uh, reminded of its unfinished business while we strive to build a more perfect union. The senseless killing of George. So. My apologies there. A nation once again was reminded of this unfinished business while we strive to build a more perfect union. The senseless killing of George uh, Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery. And one can actually see the list goes on if we look at the history of the last few years. What I saw, what I saw was hope. I saw hope in the thousands of people who stood up in the last 10 days. I saw hope in those young men and women who stood up to challenge an unjust system. Young men and women, as Ms. President, you have indicated, across a vast land. And they reminded me of Dr. King. King was only 25 years when he led the civil rights movement. And those young men and women from all shades and backgrounds, they all rose up and said enough was enough. They all rose up and said, not anymore. And my prayer has always been and remains that we can come to a point in the history of this nation when difference will no longer make a difference. So we can come to a point in the history of our nation when difference no longer matters. Thank you for your leadership again. Thank you, Provost. Vice President Rotolo, uh, would you like to say anything at this point? Sorry, I was having some problems in muting and uh, getting my video back on. Yes, thank you, President Lemons. And um, I, I, I am, I'm shocked, but what I've seen uh, on the news and happening all around over the last uh, week or so. And um, I think it's very important that we lean in as a community, stand in solidarity in this fight and in this, in this movement forward for this country and for all people. Thank you. Thank you. So President Lemons, uh, if you are ready to move on to your updates um, about the budget or uh, other topics, um, then this would be a good time to, to do that. Okay, so um, I would like to, at this point, I would like to, to turn to Vice President Rotolo for just a, we're, this, this session probably won't focus a lot on the budget, uh, although we'll be watching the questions coming in. If there uh, are questions around that that we can answer, we certainly will try to do that. But uh, I, most of these sessions, we're going to have some update on the budget. And so I, I wonder, if Vice President Rotolo, if you can just give us a brief update on where we are in the process. Thank you, President Lemons, and good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be back with you again. First, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank everyone, every member of the college community who I know worked very hard putting together their budget and submissions. <clears throat> everyone sharpened their pencils and looked for efficiencies in non-personnel areas. Uh, they've minimized the impact on people. 
Over the past week, the Tanya Ortega and I have met with school deans and divisional VPs to review their budget submissions. We're putting to everything together, and over the next week, we should know where we're at and what we uh, may need to further do or exactly where we've been. I can tell you that we have met 95% of our goal in the, with OTPS cut, cut, so congratulations and thank you to everyone. That was really a tremendous job. Uh, we still do not know what our actual budget or our budget reduction will be for fiscal year 21, but I'm confident that with everyone's collaboration and hard work, we will be where we need to be at the end of this exercise. So again, I really thank you all very much for all your hard work in putting in and reducing your budgets. Thank you. Um, and so I think I'd like to move on to a topic that there was a question that, that uh, came in advance of this session and, and uh, Provost Nosu, I'm gonna ask you to respond to this initially uh, about the CARES Act and how it is uh, being made available, what the, how the funding is being made available to students. Would you want to speak to that, uh, uh, President uh, Lemons, and then I can add to, to that question. Okay, sure. So um, I can, uh, I, I will give a little bit of background information on this in terms of uh, where we are uh, as of today. There are about 190,000 students around CUNY that were uh, were found to be eligible for the CARES Act funding. So for the whole university, that was $118 million to be distributed directly to students. And the, the amounts that were distributed ranged from about $150 up to no, over 900, depending on part-time or full-time status of the student and depending on el the eligibility for Pell, the average amount was $610. There are about 45,000 students who were not eligible because they had not completed FAFSA applications. Although since then, I think uh, over 10,000 of those have been found to actually have done that. And about 1,500 have filled them out since then. Uh, but there is a very short period of time yet when students can fill out the FAFSA application and still receive funds. So um, that's, that is the, uh, the basic dis distribution. There's a small amount, about 3% of funding allocated for Lehman College is coming, has come directly to the college. And we have not yet determined exactly how we will distribute those funds. But one of the things that's happened just recently is US, US Department of Education did rule made a change in the rule so that students with a criminal record would be able to receive funds. So that should make some more of our students eligible and uh, probably be one of those places where that extra 3% yet would go. And then on the, there's another $118 million that came to the university as a whole that will be distributed to the institutions. And those funds, uh, we're still waiting for approval from the state for the university's plan on how they will be distributed, but they have to be distributed to cover the costs that are related to COVID-19, half of them just to the delivery costs of COVID-19, that is things that we did to go online or that we're going to be doing for the summer or the fall. So all the training costs, extra uh, technical technology that was needed for students or for the faculty and staff to make that happen. And then other costs, there've been lots of costs that have we've encountered in making the transition. So those funding, uh, that funding will come to the college with some, a number of possible ways that it can be used. And we haven't received it yet and we won't receive it until the state approves it and we will be spending that money out over the next year, over a period of time. And we already know that sounds like a lot of funding. Lehman College should be getting around seven million, but we already have accounted for a very high percentage of those funds and what we have already spent. 
And so, Provost, do you um, have additional things that you want to say about that? Yes, I, I, I do. And, and, and just two things in terms of the points you raised. Uh, one is the preparation that we're making actually to prepare us for both summer and fall. And you recall, and everyone knows that at the last meeting we had, I did indicate that some of those initiatives we have under those six objectives that fall within those three goals uh, that we have outlined with a task force that I established to prepare us for both us, uh, a successful summer and fall. Uh, those initiatives, we, we have actually provided some cost estimates to them, and they include cost estimates for things we have to do to ensure that we have uh, students uh, be able to prepare to learn in a virtual environment much more effectively. The other part of it is also a funding to support faculty professional development, uh, both at the full-time level uh, for faculty who are full-time as well as for faculty who are part adjunct, adjunct as well. There is also the component on technology support. I did speak about um, uh, MiFi hotspots. Those are things we anticipate to uh, uh, continue to support uh, in, in order to enhance the student experience in the classroom. Uh, that particular initiative that deals with technology support is one that Vice President uh, 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 for IT, uh, Ron Bergman, uh, is actually providing leadership. Uh, in addition to that, there's a piece with online education coming from our online education office. Uh, there are tools that have been developed as well to support both faculty and student. Uh, many of those will be funded through the CARES Act itself. But there's a group uh, sometimes that we, we, we are not forgetting, uh, but they don't re really necessarily, and there are students, uh, they are not benefiting from the CARES Act. And those are students who fall into three categories. Uh, students who are undocumented, uh, students who are dreamers or DACA, and students who are international as well. And so what we have done as, uh, with the work uh, of our vice president for uh, institutional advancement is really to uh, explore opportunities with our donors. And we did receive uh, a major gift from the Robin Foundation uh, to help us uh, develop uh, micro grants and the amount of $1,000 each uh, for each of those students. And we have been working uh, with our Dean of Students and our, our Student Affairs Office, uh, as well as uh, our, our Vice President uh, Ebersol's office uh, to develop a protocol for distributing these funds. Uh, what I do want to underscore here is whilst we have a sense of who the international students are, we have a sense of who the dreamers are, it is pretty very hard to identify undocumented students. And we may know who they are in our community, and so I want to encourage everyone uh, who is listening, if you do know a student who is undocumented, it's pretty very hard for students to give that information. We want to be able to have them use this available resource and we have a deadline of June 30th to utilize this fund. Uh, we have sent out uh, letters to all students uh, encouraging them and we have a few who have already applied, uh, nine undocumented students. I have not seen any graduate student uh, who has applied. I suspect across those three spectrum international undocumented and dreamers, there may be that as well. So we're just encouraging students to uh, utilize uh, the opportunity provided by these micro grants. Uh, these are uh, students who are not eligible for Title IV uh, financial aid support. And uh, we also want to let them know that they are not forgotten in this, in this whole equation. They too have been impacted by the COVID pand pandemic as well. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Provost Mosu, is that, did you want to uh, proceed with your presentation? Yeah, the other, it's not really a, a necessarily a presentation, but I do want to follow up in, and, and speak to, last week we finished the spring semester, but they are still unfinished business from that spring semester. Uh, that I want to draw attention to. One has to do with the credit, no credit policy. Uh, we've had to move very quickly on a number of fronts, and I want to thank our faculty and our students 
uh, for the work they've done in making sure that grades were turned in by the due date of May 28th. Now, having said that, we've also discovered that even with the information we shared with our students on the great, on the credit, no credit uh, policy, uh, about 458 of our students actually uh, uh, selected the credit, no credit option. Um, if you think about that in terms of the number of students we have on campus, uh, that's quite uh, uh, an important uh, number there. But we've also discovered that in some cases there were students who wanted to, who selected a credit in error. <laughs> so we're asking those students to go back and uh, fix the problem and uh, to contact the registrar's office to ensure that, there's, that, that that error is corrected. I also want to inform students uh, uh, who are asking questions again at the deadline to make sure uh, that you have this done is June uh, 25th. You have to be the one to make that change, not the faculty. As I mentioned in my email to the campus community, it is not the faculty member who makes that decision for the student. It is the student who has to make that determination. So those who have submitted uh, or selected the credit, no credit, and had some errors, uh, they can contact the senior registrar uh, to ensure that they make the correction. And those who are still thinking of making any change of, uh, they have ju till June 25th uh, to respond uh, to that. The other area where we've been having um, concerns and questions has to do with financial aid, and I want to point out some, some important notes. Um, if you go to the, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, our financial aid office does a huge amount of work, and this is the office that is again tied to our enrollment management shop. That enrollment management shop manages uh, our credit, uh, uh, no credit um, policy implementation. They did process before we got into this COVID crisis over $100 million uh, in financial aid uh, last year. But uh, suddenly we saw ourselves moving, if you go to the next slide, we suddenly saw ourselves moving into a new virtual environment. And that environment affected our students' ability uh, to engage uh, the office and certainly also impacted the ability of our office to respond as quickly as we can. And if one looks at the, the, the data that I have uh, looked at, uh, that office uh, receives uh, on average 500 emails every day from students, but some of these emails are duplicates. Uh, they also receive over 1,200 phone calls um, as recently uh, as a few weeks ago, if you compare this uh, to what was happening prior to the COVID crisis. And we only have two folks who answer these calls. So it's, it's an enormous demand uh, in that office. It takes some, somewhere around 10 minutes to 45 minutes uh, to resolve an issue. And so I know that there have been some emails sent to my office, and I want to just encourage our students to have patience with us. Um, and, uh, and as they submit the documents, to ensure that some of those documents that we receive, that, uh, that they have them signed. And if there's an error, the office will notify them and be patient. Let me uh, uh, have the next slide as well. I want to point out some, some key things that we have done to ensure that we strengthen uh, our sup uh, the support of the staff. When we moved into the COVID environment, they, they all didn't necessarily have the laptops to work from home. <laughs> you know, we have provided them with uh, those uh, equipment. And I want to thank our IT unit and our VP for admin and finance, Rene Rotolo, for the work they did to move this aggressively. Uh, we are working with IT and CUNY uh, for a way to securely, for students to securely submit uh, documents that they can sign electronically. And my understanding is that we may have a solution to this as early as next week uh, because the documents do require signatures. We are also working with our IT to explore a way to utilize uh, QLess. A number of our students know about QLess, that's our appointment system. And for units at the institution, uh, that are not using that. I have had discussions with Vice President Bergman 
as a way to expand and extend uh, the use of that tool to other offices within the university that support students so that students can actually have an appointment made through the system and then uh, the office staff will then call them uh, once they, they have that appointment. So we're working aggressively to uh, implement that system. I will encourage students to give our office seven days uh, when they send an email at the minimum so that they can respond to that email. And if you've sent in documents, just to be patient uh, that they will respond uh, to you as well. Uh, one of the things I want to encourage our students to do is to uh, ensure that they act early. If they have not completed the FAFSA form and the TAP application to do so quickly, uh, that's going to be important as we work on enrollment. Uh, and if uh, you're waiting for, uh, 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 if you make a request, uh, give, give the office some time, I am confident that they will respond uh, to you. And be sure to provide all of the information uh, in one email as best as, as you can. I know sometimes uh, multiple emails are sent on the same thing. So I want to encourage the students before they click send that email to make sure that they provide information that also include their ID number and provide as much information as possible to help the staff in the, in the office. Ask as many questions as you can uh, when you send that email request and then the staff will respond. And then check your CUNY um, a first account uh, for missing document uh, requests and holds because that's where the staff would also uh, provide some additional information. And I want to encourage our students to check the financial aid website for periodic updates. Again, um, urge uh, for patience as we go through this. I'm confident given the uh, tools we've provided, the equipment we've provided, our staff uh, that they will continue to work uh, faster uh, to um, um, engage our students um, on issues related to financial aid. So I'll stop here, Joshanda. Thank you, Provost Wilson. So um, one of the questions that's come up um, more recently, uh, just was forwarded to me actually, is related to a question about um, something that CUNY reported yesterday, which is that summer enrollment is up 17% across the schools. Um, and we're wondering if that's the case at Lehman, and do we think that that bodes well for the fall? Um, but we're also, there's also a question about whether or not we're actively planning for a fall enrollment increase, and if so, what are the plans? And I'll ask Renee to speak to this as well as the president. If you don't mind, I can uh, respond with the data Please. that I do have. Uh, yes, um, uh, CUNY did report a summer enrollment of up to 17% uh, across the, uh, the whole system, across all schools. Uh, uh, there is actually a seven, almost a 14% increase in summer enrollment. Most of that is coming from uh, the comprehensive and community, uh, senior comprehensive and community colleges. And most of the increases uh, that, you, that you find, um, there is a, an edge amongst uh, the senior colleges. And Lehman is one of those senior colleges where you see an increase in summer enrollment. I, want, I do want to provide a caveat here, because when you look at the data, uh, uh, it doesn't capture all of the uh, summer that we anticipate to happen, uh, given the fact that we have multiple summer sessions. What we are looking at now is just our first session. Uh, some institutions in, within CUNY don't have that multiple sessions, as many as we have. And so what that really means for us is actually um, good news. If we continue the trend we have with regard to enrollment for this first session that began uh, on Monday, uh, then uh, there's a great likelihood that that will extend to the rest of um, uh, the summer sessions. So yes, we are currently up by 14.4% uh, and we, the, next, uh, the second uh, summer session begins uh, mid-July. I do want to thank our deans. I do want to thank our department chairs, uh, our enrollment management office, uh, for their efforts uh, to provide support to students 
uh, the work that they have done across since the spring semester to ensure that we have a robust summer and certainly to ensure that we have a, a robust fall. While summer is looking okay, it's looking good, the projections for fall, uh, we have been indicating uh, is going to probably be flat. <laughs> that's, that's the, the, the um, assumption we are using flat based on last year. Uh, there are reports that enrollment can be as down as, uh, to as much as 15% uh, across. Um, so what we are trying to, across the system, so we're, what we're trying to do is to ensure that we take a more cautious approach. Uh, whilst we're optimistic, we're still cautious, and that's why we are, uh, we are working on the assumption of a flat enrollment. And that flat means really if we can stay with what we had last year, we will be in a much better space. Our team continues to work very hard. Uh, and, and again, all of this is going to be dependent on how students respond uh, to the governors and the president can speak better to this in terms of the governor's approach to how we reopen for fall. Uh, we are trying to be as prudent as we can be at Lehman. Uh, CUNY has also reported an overall decrease in students filing for financial aid. And I just talked about this financial aid. And that's why it was important for me to provide that initial um, uh, update and to encourage our students um, to be patient and work well with that office. Um, and if we take that um, downturn or decrease in the filing of financial aid, um, uh, in the past has been an indicator of where enrollment will be or could be in the fall. There are a number of steps we have taken. Um, we've done a lot of calling campaigns. That has been very helpful. Uh, we've done uh, parent information sessions uh, with our enrollment management office. That's been very helpful. Uh, we have a graduate marketing campaign uh, thanks to the president and uh, VP Rotolo, they did provide $100,000 in, in funding that we uh, used last semester to begin this process of graduate marketing. And actually that went into digital marketing. As a result, we did see an uptick in graduate numbers for summer uh, so far and an uptick in graduate enrollment as well for fall, much uh, higher than what we saw last year. So that's the news on fall. We're still tracking, uh, but we, we are cautious in terms of, of our approach and very prudent as well. And uh, VP Rotolo can add to that along with the president. Vice President uh, Rotolo, anything you yeah. want to add to that? Uh, I, you know, I've been tracking the numbers daily. I get my daily report and it's very encouraging what I'm seeing. Um, you know, I, I, I think some of the hesitation about fall is because we still don't know whether we're going to be back on campus or if we're going to be going remote and we don't know whether or not that'll impact what some students decisions and they may be waiting to enroll to know what our outcome is going to be what the decision is going to be so i think it's the unknowns that uh, that uh, don't allow us to know for sure uh what our what we're, what we're anticipating for the fall I think it's probably fair to say that we have never operated in an environment with so much uncertainty in so many big ways. Would you agree? <laughs> oh yeah, it's it's really very trying. You know, I'd rather know and then be able to just deal with it. It's the unknown. It's not knowing. It's it's trying to guess and trying to you know, am I are we looking at cutting too much? Are we looking at you know? potentially losing more students than we're just, it's, it's terrible. The unknowns are horrible. I'd rather know. Part of that question had to do with being prepared for being over-enrolled. And that, yeah. is, that is part of the uncertainty that really yeah. doesn't even have to do with us. It has to do with what other colleges and universities are doing around the country and the potential way that their decisions as the fall approaches could change the plans that students are making in terms of where they will enroll. So talk about something that is totally out of our control yeah. uh, and, and unpredictable. So, you know, we, we really, we will know, uh, we can tell you probably firmly about the first week of September 
That's how probably. the fall term is looking at yeah. the moment. <laughs> <laughs> That's about right. <laughs> well, speaking of that uncertainty, President Lemons, um, I wonder if you could talk about what we're about to face next week as New York City opens up uh, in the phase one um, of the governor's plan. Um, there are some people who are still wondering what Lehman's plans are to institute safety measures as, sure. um, and, and maybe if there's any update on when the campus will be open to us. So again, we, we don't have uh, anything clear because uh, even if New York City begins to open up as they're expecting now around June 8th or middle of next week, that's phase one of the four phases and we're in the fourth phase. Each of those phases is supposed to last around two weeks if everything goes well. So that would, that would put us still eight weeks after that. And but let's assume that it is two weeks and that it starts the middle of next week. What does that mean for us? We still have a lot of decisions that we will have to make based on what the New York State and the New York City Departments of Health are telling us what are the guidelines? And so again, we're into another realm of uncertainty. Last week, I guess it was the, the end of May, the last week of May. Yeah, that was last week. Um, <laughs> both the CDC and the US uh, Department of Health and Human Services released new documents with guidelines. One was on testing from Health and Human Services and CDC was a new guideline for campuses. Uh, and the very beginning of that document from the CDC says that the more people are exposed to each other, the greater the risk of transmitting the virus. And that really remains our underlying situation. And after all of the, the, the governments and agencies that set guidelines for us have done that, we'll have to look at our own situation and decide how we're gonna use those guidelines. Yesterday I was in a, a meeting with, uh, that was sponsored by the American Association of State Colleges and Universities and that's a, that is a group that uh, we're a member of and it's a lot of colleges and universities that are like we are. About half of all the college students in the country are go to, to uh, colleges and universities that are members of that organization. And they brought on uh, an expert who is actually at the University of Minnesota. And um, he said some really interesting things, some which I knew and some things which I didn't fully understand. But one of the things that we all know, I think, is that across the entire country, only about 5% of Americans at this point have been exposed to SARS-CoV-2, the virus. That's kind of a, a shocking number when you think that well over 100,000 Americans have now died from an infection of that virus, and yet only 5% of the population is exposed. So we are very, very far from herd immunity. And even though New York City is well above that exposure level in the Bronx in particular, is highest in New York City in terms of uh, numbers of people per 100,000 who have been exposed to the virus, still, even in the Bronx, we're way, way below anything like herd immunity, which means that the risk of transmission and then the consequences of that are still very, very high. 85 days ago, COVID-19 was the 85th cause of death in the US, and a few days ago, it was number one. It isn't right now, but that hasn't happened since 1918, uh, the flu epidemic of 1918. So that's a little context for what we're looking at in terms of New York City reopening and what that might mean. There is very likely to be another wave or multiple waves of infection that will happen. And before, by the time we get to 60% to 80% of the population having been exposed, um, we're going to be a long ways from now. The other thing that we don't know is whether coronavirus infections will re result in immunity. You may wonder why we keep hearing this reservation that's expressed by public health officials. They don't really know if 
when someone has antibodies already formed to the virus, if they are now immune or how long they will stay immune if they are. Apparently with coronaviruses, immunity usually does not last very long, not like exposure to some other kinds of viruses and bacteria. We don't know about this one, but there's a lot of concern that even if you've been exposed you, and you become immune, you may not stay immune for a very long time. So these are, again, throw that into our huge pile of uncertainties here. So that's kind of the, the background uh, of where we are. One of the great hopes that we've, we've heard over and over and over again is testing. You listen to Nancy Pelosi, she says testing, testing, testing. Uh, that has become kind of the mantra that, uh, that our uh, politicians are using as well as public health officials. But the truth is, testing is very unreliable. Uh, in Minnesota, for instance, half of the tests that were, were the antibody tests were false positives. There are lots of false negative tests. So using comprehensive testing, not only is it expensive and logistically very difficult to do, uh, is really complex and problematic in terms of how you use it to protect individuals or something like a campus. We already know that it will not be feasible to test everybody coming onto the Lehman College campus. CUNY has a task force that's working on this. I'm on that task force. I'm particularly, I'm working on the testing part of that. Uh, and we know that at this point, unless something changes dramatically, both in the reliability of testing, but also the availability of it and the cost, that that's not going to be an approach we can use. So when we are able to bring more people onto campus, and I have to emphasize, I think we only should do that if we absolutely must do that. If, if there are vital functions that are really compromised and telework doesn't help us solve those problems, Yes, we're going to have to find out how we can do that on campus, but when we do it, we're going to have to be very careful about our protocols, about screening individuals who come on campus, about them using all the safeguards that we know about, which is uh, keeping the air safe around individuals, having masks all the time, hand hygiene, PPE where it's needed, all those things. Those are the things that uh, we will have to do. And I want to um, turn this over to Vice President Rotolo, who also has set up a task force which is on campus that is working on all these issues. I'm sure that Vice President Rotolo, you've got some things you can add to that. Mm. Yes, well, first of all, you know, what we do know now is that we are still going to be fully online in the summer. So even if sometime in mid to late July, we're given the okay to come and reoccupy campus, it's gonna be minimal people actually coming on board. In fact, part of our plan, and we're putting together a draft plan, it's uh, very preliminary right now. I expect that within the next few weeks it will be completed um, and ready for further review. Um, but there is a committee that's comprised of people from across the campus, including health and safety, public safety, um, some representatives of the PSC. Um, and we're having these same discussions about how we come back, how we keep people safe, how we, what protocols we put in, in place to ensure, you know, one thing we know we've done well is, is maintaining the, the cleanliness and, and disinfecting well in, behind everybody. Um, so we will continue those procedures. We've been ordering supplies. We know that people will need to maintain masks when they're out, when they're not in a private office. Uh, we know that we're gonna need to minimize the amount of pe people in sh shared offices. Um, we're gonna have to keep numbers lower or if we need to have people in the same place, we need to either find it in a larger space where we can disperse people further apart or outside where we can rely on uh, um, not mechanical supply air systems, but rather the outside environment where you've got a lot of fresh air. Fortunately, most of our buildings, not all, but most of our buildings have operable windows so we can bring fresh air in, which, which will help. But I, I don't think we're gonna see a return to uh, fully filled classrooms and lecture halls the way we had. And, and, and again, you know, without having a definite 
answer about what's going to happen in the fall. It's hard to say for sure, but I, I just, I don't see it happening. I don't think anyone else anticipates it happening. Um, but we're coordinating our work with the CUNY-wide Environmental Health and Safety uh, Committee who's looking at this, uh, as long as, uh, as well as reading all of the literature and studies that are out there. And we're incorporating all of the best practices into the plan. Mr. President, Thank you. and if I add if just a few comments to that in terms of the academic side, uh, on, uh, and I concur with all that's been said, uh, 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 just to re-emphasize re that uh, CUNY's public position, of course, is that we continue to plan uh, uh, and uh, prepare for fully online for fall or a hybrid approach that is largely online. Uh, the president serves on, on one of the task forces established by the chancellor. I serve on the other task force that's looking at academic continuity and student support services. And we had another meeting today, and what seems to be clear from that meeting is that we will continue to plan in this direction. Uh, there was also a study that was done at, by CUNY that looked at courses offered in fall to get a sense, not spring but fall, uh, since we're returning to fall to get a sense of which of these courses uh, will be much more effectively offered in, uh, in, in fall using a virtual approach similar to what we try to do over the, over the spring. And 90% of those courses across CUNY were identified to be in that mode. Another 10% was assumed to be more amenable to in-person. And so in terms of what uh, VP Rotolo is indicating, if we do have to that will be around um, on the academic side for that 10% uh, that may include labs and so on. Uh, but we're also planning as if labs will not be the case uh, since we have all of this depends on the, on the public health uh, situation. And so that's where we are. The good news here is that both, uh, not both, uh, the Department of Education, uh, Middle States and NYSED have extended the uh, permission they gave us for spring uh, to plan again uh, for distance learning modality and support services uh, for fall extending through December 31st. So we have that also uh, in place and we continue to plan. Provost, I, I wonder if you, there's a question that came in um, around what we do for production classes or lab classes where students need uh, on on campus lab facilities in order to to do their work and Vice President Rotolo, you may want to comment on that as well. It's actually I was going to add to what Provost Wosu was saying that we're, what we're going to be looking at is hybrid models in most situations, whether it's people that work on campus as part of their job, people in labs or or, or different classes that are required to be done on campus. We're gonna be staggering people. We're not gonna have the large groups together in the room, but we're gonna reorganize the rooms. We're gonna keep very safe distances between people within the spaces. We have to look at how we can affect the airflow within the spaces so that if, for argument's sake, and, and again, this isn't all flushed out, but if you're running a class of 24, you may have six in this day, and then at the and, and everybody else online, and then six in the next day with everybody else online. So it's going to be a lot of remote work with uh, on campus work, but staggering. And I would just say that, of course, that is also dependent on uh, the very fact that we're part of a larger ecosystem. Um, as the president mentioned before, we're in that fourth phase of, of reopening. And so uh, if we then get the, uh, the uh, uh, go ahead to do so for higher education and, the, and, and CUNY tells us then of that, and then it's safe, that's actually when we, we move into that particular phase. But we're planning, we're planning, we don't want to be caught off of, of, of God. Thank you. I wanted to respond to a couple questions that um, may not have been answered in something, something I said about testing. Um, I just one of them is, you know, when you look at the zip code map and you look at uh, estimation now of uh, the percentage of residents that are positive, that the, there are zip codes in the Bronx that indicate 50% of the population has been exposed. Um, and, you know, what does that mean for us? Uh, and first of all, I have to add again 
that big uh, caveat, I think it's that big, um, uh, you know, the saying is a grain of rice, but I think this is a, as a bucket of rice on the, the reliability of those positive tests. And most people who uh, are really into this will say, first of all, that you have to have two separate tests done before you can really confirm that it really is positive. I mentioned the 50% false positive rate in uh, Minnesota that was that was that's been found in in many places so that's one one uh aspect of that but a related question is are we going to be able to test faculty and staff who come onto campus and uh because of the unreliability and also the cost but i would say even more the complexity of just uh interpreting the results we do not plan to systematically test however we do want to have testing available for uh, individuals who come onto campus who may want it for various reasons. And that's one of the recommendations I think that we'll be making to the chancellor is that uh, for individuals who, for instance, have uh, just because they're essential workers and they have, uh, or essential personnel, and they have uh, exposure to the public or individuals that do come on campus and wish to be tested, we hope we would like to try to make that available uh, so that those who want it can have it. And there may be other special cases where there are groups of people where we really can't attain the kind of uh, distancing that would be ideal. Uh, we may, those groups of people may be candidates too. So these are, these are protocols and recommendations that are actually actively under development right now. There's a question that came in very early, uh, Vice President Otolo. I think this would this is one I would like to to have you respond to, and it has to do with uh, the, with our public safety officers on campus and with the New York City police on campus. That obviously is a concern, given uh, all the concern about policing. Um, and uh, I could say some things, but I think you're a better person to really comment about our, our who's, who's on Lehman campus, uh, who is our public safety, what is their relationship to the New York City Police Department? Well, my experience with them, not just in my role now as the vice president and overseeing them, but in my former role as the assistant vice president for facilities and working very closely with them, they are an incredibly dedicated, diverse group of people who are very dedicated to safety at Lehman. Um, they're, they are, um, you know, unlike some of the incidents you'll see, you, I, I've seen acted out on TV in, in interactions between police and the community they're responding to, our officers are very restrained. Uh, I can't think of any incidences where they've actually gotten out of control and, and responded in an inappropriate way to an incident happening either with faculty or even outsiders on our campus. They really are very professional, very dedicated, um, and, and, and I, I feel much safer because they're there. And I, I know most of the college community, I, I think all of the college community feels that way as well. Um, so I do not have any concerns about them responding in an inappropriate way to anyone on campus. And we've had situations where we've had protests, um, and we have not had incidents. So I, I'm very comfortable with them, and I, I hope the rest of the community feels that way. Thank you. And the one thing I can add to that, uh, and it actually relates to another question that was, that was posted, uh, I think probably most of us that are in this session are very concerned about the idea of the kind of progressive militarization of, of police in general. That is something that started happening in the 80s. And uh, I know from my own experience as an elected public official, that's been a concern of mine, that, that trend. And that kind of going from the sort of Norman Rockwell painting of the, the police, you may have seen this, the yeah. old painting, Norman Rockwell, the police officers at the, uh, the bar of the diner sitting on a stool and next to him is this young 
boy who's kind of looking up in admiration. And then, you know, you juxtapose that to the, the picture of a, a police officer that's fully dressed in, in riot gear and bulletproof vests and everything. I mean, that the image is, that's a stark contrast. And I think that's a pretty big concern for many. One of the things that I have been so impressed with uh, at Lehman College is the attitude that starts right at the very top with uh, Fausto Ramirez, who's the director of public safety, and his intention to not have our public safety in any way present in that way, but to be very much in the, the model of being integrated into the campus, to know who's on campus. Uh, and, and I really, I, I have seen that in action. I've seen that in decisions that have been made a real dedication to have an open campus and one that is open that isn't being reinforced by a kind of heavy policing attitude. So we have about four minutes left uh, in case there are any closing remarks or anything else that you wanted to address before we vote. I would so, uh, Vice President Rotolo, any any closing comments that you would like to make? Um, I, I I would again like to thank the community because I I was really expecting the um, uh, going through the budget reductions to be and I'm, don't get me wrong it wasn't painful and hard work but to be more difficult than it's been so I really want to thank everyone for their hard work and for being very thoughtful and considerate in what they've put together and what they've submitted. Thank and I you. also, I mean, I look forward to being back on campus. I <laughs> wish it would be sooner. <laughs> I miss it. <laughs> Thank, you so, thank you so much, Renee. And uh, Mr. President, I, I re-echo the same uh, uh, sentiments that uh, VP Rotolo shares here. Uh, and I've said, and I'm sure a, a number of folks feel the same way, uh, this experience makes it very hard to really know the difference between weekdays and weekends, because you're constantly working and working and working. So I want to thank the community, but I also want to thank our students for their resilience. And I want to end with good news with our student athletes, because oftentimes that's another sector of our community that we sometimes uh, don't thank enough. Like the rest of the college community, uh, they too endured a lot of the challenges, their mixed practices and so on. And they focused on their work at home. And they, these included members of a basketball team, uh, the baseball, soccer, uh, tennis, cross country, volleyball, indoor track, uh, swimming, uh, softball teams. And I was very pleased to receive from our Dean of Students, Dr. Basil, and the Director of Athletics, uh, Dr. Zawarin, and Excel sheet just last evening uh, that provides the spring semester cumulative grade point average for all of our 16 teams. And the spring uh, GPA stands at 3.05. In spite of all of these challenges, those students were able to perform well. And I'm very proud of all of them. Uh, the faculty who worked with them, our coaching staff, our support staff, uh, they did a great job uh, working with those students, uh, even in an hour and a time of crisis. So I want to say thank you to all of them and congratulations to our students and urge everyone to remain well and, and be safe through uh, this uh, summer semester. Thank you, Provost. That is really, that is great news. Congratulations to all of our student athletes. Thank you. So the, I I'd like to end with the kind of circling back to where we started. Some of you may have heard this said, but uh, there, there are, I think we're going to find many ways to talk about the era that we're in at the moment. But one of the ones I saw that struck me is that we're simultaneously back in 1918, 1929, and in the 60s. Uh, a pandemic, a financial meltdown, and civil unrest. Uh, over major societal issues. And I, that's all true. That's not, that is in no way uh, hyperbole. That really is where we are. And I think that I'm sure we're all having our sleepless nights and 
we can't help but be extremely concerned and we're all experiencing different aspects of, of what that means. But at the same time, I, I feel like as a community Lehman College is responding, I feel hopeful. I feel that we can deal with what we're dealing with as tough as it is. And that's not to minimize in any way the unevenness with which these consequences are distributed because it is uneven. Some are feeling it way more than others. But still, I feel we are going to emerge from this. We're going to go through it. And we're going to be intact. And I want to thank everybody. I'm really, really pleased uh, at everybody who's been here this afternoon. It's great to gather as a community, as a college. It's, it's, it's a little frustrating because we can't see each other and we, we're missing that kind of aspect of our physical presence. But nonetheless, we're gathered, we're here, and we're interacting. So thank you all uh, very much for coming, and uh, we'll look forward to our next session. Thank you. Thank you.